Hello, Undisputed listeners. This is Skip Bayless. Weekdays on Undisputed, I debate my co-host Shannon Sharp on the biggest sports news of the day. But now it is time for me to unleash in a brand new way. Introducing the Skip Bayless Show. My opportunity to share behind the scenes stories about things I've seen and confrontations I've had from decades covering the NFL and NBA. This is an opportunity to go so much deeper into solo opinions that just don't fit in rapid fire debate. I will respond to your no holes barred question. You can ask me anything about why I've said what I've said or about what goes on off camera on Undisputed. Your question should be as provocative as you want. My answer sure will be. New episodes of The Skip Bayless Show will come out each week. Make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Taft. This podcast is the full show from today's episode of Undisputed from start to finish. They've got a busy slate, so skip Shannon. Let's get to it. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp. Guys, good morning. How are we doing today? Happy Friday. Good, good morning. Boy, my MVP looking good, ain't it? Oh, Greek Freak. Oh, y'all is out to Takumpo. Oh, GF, Greek Freak. He looking good, Skip. Two triple doubles in under 30 minutes. 30 point triple doubles. You're boring our viewers as usual. <laughs> Nobody cares about the Greek freak on this Friday heading into wild, it. wild card weekend. All that anybody cares about is that the moment of reckoning is upon yes. you, Shannon Sharp. My Dallas Cowboys are about to do what I predicted they would do back in training camp. Ooh. They are about to win one playoff game at Jerry World, and they will cost you another 10 cases of diet do before this show is over. Thank you very much. You see how animated you are? You see how boastful and jubilant you are? I'm just excited. Now, I'm just you joyful. Have, you won't have that same energy on Monday. Bet that. I will. I will have it times 100. <laughs> I'm going to explode like a nuclear bomb on Monday okay. morning at 930 Eastern okay. right here on these airwaves. Book it. Okay. okay. I'm Woo! <laughs> Are you ready for that? I'm ready. I'm ready for I'm Monday. Ready. Okay, so yes, we will get to the Cowboys. I promise you that because today is the day. Skip jumping out of his seat there, but we have to begin with some news. Another coach is out, guys, and this one had everyone talking yesterday. The Texans have parted away because the David Foley of just one season as head coach after the 66-year-old went 4-13 and in Houston. And when you combine Foley's departure with Brian Flores being let go by the Dolphins earlier this week, there is now one black head coach in the NFL, and that's Mike Tomlin in Pittsburgh. So, Shannon, I start with you. What is your reaction to this? I'm not surprised. I don't know why people think sports is not a microcosm of society. Black coaches are held to a higher standard than their white counterparts. It's as simple as that. Skip, if we go back and see, Skip, I don't need, we need to do more research. I have 100 years of empirical data that says that black head coaches are not given the same opportunities. And when they get a job, Skip, what job did they give Tony Dungy? Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What job did they give Herman was for his first job? The New York Jets. What job did they give Todd Bowles for his first job? The New York Jets. You see what they do, Skip Bayless? They give you a job mm. where they know you can't succeed. And as soon as they give you that job and you don't succeed, what do they do? David Culley, they set the man up for failure. How are you going to win with the quarterback situation that they had? They traded DeAndre Hopkins the year before. They let J.J. <laughs> White go. And so now the covers are bare. Come in. It's like a CEO, Skip. You give a black CEO, we're going to make you CEO of this company that's in, for, that's in bankruptcy. Well, if you don't lead us out of bankruptcy, well, we need to go in another direction because he didn't turn it around. Really? Skip, people don't remember. They fired Tony Dungy after a 9 and 7 season. They fired Jim Caldwell after a 9 and 7 after season. Hired Mike season. Patricia. I'm going to do one, one better, Skip. What do you think the odds are that a black head coach can say, nah, Jacksonville, we don't want to interview with you like Dan Quinn did? What <laughs> black coach can do what Josh McDaniels did? Get the job and then resign from the job via facts. 
He'll never, ever get to be a head coaching candidate again in his life. Doug Marone resigned from the Buffalo Bills as head coach and went and got the job at the Jacksonville Jaguars. Do you believe any black coach? No. Now, for the, no. In the 100-year history, Skip, what they'll do, they'll point to Mike Tomlin. Mike Tomlin is a one in a 100-year situation. A black head coach got a job at a cornerstone franchise with an established yeah. quarterback already in place. That's not normally how it happens. And if you Good see, point. he rewarded that. He's, go- he's never had a losing season, if I'm not mistaken, Skip, in 15 years. No. He's gone to two mm-hmm. Super Bowls. He's won one of those Super Bowls. So for me, Skip, I'm not surprised because the data over the 100 years says this is how. They're expected to do more with less, and when they don't, well, he didn't get the job done. Who in the hell thought that David Culley was going to make the playoff with the Houston Texans? Everybody, by all indication, thought he did an unbelievable job, given the situation that was placed upon him, Skip. Mm-hmm. You didn't, first of all, Skip, you didn't even want David Culley. He was a lap after everybody else had turned you, possibly turned you down. You're like, well, you know what? We might as well go get the black guy, knowing that we're not only going to keep him unless he gets to the playoffs. We're not going to keep him. But at least he got a job. Well, Shannon, you got to think, well, if you give me a job and you set me up for failure, what is that? Now, granted, it looks like, Skip, he got, what, three years left at about $17 million, So he's going to get some yeah. bread. At least he got that on his resume. Black, coach, black coaching candidates don't get the opportunity, Skip, to pick and choose what job they want. They want to be a head coach. Mm-hmm. David Culley waited damn near his whole life for this opportunity. So even though he knew it wasn't ideal, he knew it wasn't the right situation, Skip. If I don't take this job, hell, another one might not come along. I'm in my 60s. I've waited 30, 40 years to be a head coach. So I yep. can't pass this opportunity up. And so, Skip, it's just very, very disappointing. Steve Wilkes. Skip, remember Steve Wilkes? He got one year yeah. in Arizona. One. He, he got one year. Boom, gone. With the, with the quarterback situation that they had. The quarterback situation, the quarterback was so bad, he was a first-round draft pick. They got up off him the very next year because they get drafted Kyler Murray. But they mm. expected Steve Wilkes to turn that situation around. Joe Judge. Skip, how the hell Joe Judge get a job and keep the job after the situation that he got? All I'm saying, Skip, I am not surprised by this because we see this if you look closely in society. Sports are a microcosm of society. People get it conflicted, Skip, because they say, well, you got black and white from different backgrounds, different social religion. It, it's for a common thing. They're trying to win a game. But the higher-ups, they're like, yeah, you good enough to play quarterback. You good enough to help us win, but uh, I don't know about you being the face of our franchise. We just know. We've seen it over 100 years. Skip, I don't need... It's a small sample size. It is an enormous sample size. You don't get a sample size larger than 100 years. And the 100-year history of the NFL and its hiring practices of minorities, not just blacks, of minorities, says this is, this is a common theme, and I see it continues, continuing for a very, very long time because you don't have black owners. Skip, it, skip. It, takes a, it takes a very special person to branch outside and to make friends with someone or to be acquainted with someone that doesn't look like them, that doesn't talk like them, that didn't have the same Agreed. background as them. So when you got billionaires, most of them are white, especially in the NFL. Well, all of them are white in the NFL, with the exception of Shad Khan. He's a minority. Virginia McCaskey owned the Bears. She's a minority. She's a female. But more times than not, we're comfortable with people, Skip, that looks like us, that talk like us, that come from very similar backgrounds as us. I'm not surprised by this. Troy Vincent says something. Troy Vincent is the number two guy in command. And for him to step yep. out, of, I know Troy very well. Played against Troy, know Troy well. For him to Likewise. say what he said, it yep. lets you know. He said there is a double standard. And I can no longer just sit here in my position and bite my tongue and pretend that it isn't. It is. Everybody knows it. But you know what, Skip? It ain't a damn thing they can do about it. They can say we'll give you extra two first-round picks. We can give you, you know mm. what? We'll make it a situation where you automatically be in the playoffs. And they're like, hell no, we're not going to allow you to tell us who we can and can't hire. Got it. Appreciate it. Believe every word you just uttered. And yet, Shannon Sharp, yesterday afternoon, when I saw that 
David Culley, my Vanderbilt man, former Vanderbilt quarterback from my school, got fired after one set up to fail year. Exactly. And it dawned upon me that only Mike Tomlin is the last man standing, the last black head coach in the National Football League on the eve of the playoffs. It rocked me because the gravity of it hit me as we near yet another Martin Luther King Day on Monday. This is impossibly wrong. It's almost surreally bad. It's a bad look. It's a bad feel. It's a bad taste. And yet, Mr. Sharp, we both love the NBA as we love the NFL. And as we speak, there are 14 black head coaches in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Out of 30 franchises, there are 14 out of 30. That's almost 50%. Yep. I think you would say that's that's pretty great. That's great. That's that's how it should be, right? Yes, yes. Thank you. There's one of 32 in the National Football League. One of 32? Yet, Mr. Sharp, when I look at the evolution of the black quarterback, and I came Mm -hmm. up early in this business in an era when black quarterbacks were having an even harder time than black head coaches are as we speak. Correct. And yet, the landscape has risen to the point that there are times in the NFL when 50% of the starters are black quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. And as you well know, we have faces of the league right now and Patrick Mahomes and Dak Prescott and Kyler Murray and Russell Wilson, and I can go on, who are black quarterbacks. So so that's good. That's that's sort of caught up to the times, you, you could say. But at the coaching position, just the head coaching position, it is shameful, it is disgusting, it is embarrassing, and it's, it's inexplicably wrong because I look at the, the annual surveys done by the, uh, it's the Institute for Diversity and Ethics in Sports, they do a great job of breaking down all the hiring process in all the sports. And would you believe this past year, they gave the NFL for hiring assistant black coaches, coach, it was just coaches of color, I believe, because remember, we, we do have Ron Rivera and Robert right, Sala, right, right. so you have yeah, to give yes, them of yes, color. Yes, yes, Bernard, of color. yes, yes, but, yes. Okay, but black head coach hiring in the NFL over the last year by this institute was given an A, an A. So they're out there in the pipeline but who are they? Where are they? Do we know of them? I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't. I know that Byron Leftwich is an up and coming candidate in part because he's calling plays for the GOAT down in Tampa. And other than that, as far as rising young black assistant coaches, I'm, I'm not so sure. I know a lot of proven candidates in my book who are former black head coaches, and I have no idea whether they're going to get a shot or not. But the the point is, the the pipeline should be full of names, and and the only other name that we hear every year is obviously Eric Bieniemy. Right. In Kansas City, under Andy Reid, obviously. I'm pretty sure Eric calls plays. I'm sure Andy suggests a lot of the plays. I'm sure Andy's game plan is in place strategically where it's sort of mapped out for where it's supposed to go. Skip, but, can I, can I, can yeah, I go ahead. right here? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's just say for the sake of argument, Eric B. Enemy does not call plays. Matt Nagy got a head coaching job in Chicago, he and did. he didn't call one play under Andy Reid. Sean McVay assistance, Kyle Shanahan assistance, get head coaching yeah. jobs, and they don't call one play. Sean McVay called the plays. Kyle Shanahan called the plays. Yet their assistants get head coaching jobs Without calling plays. But if a black does that, it's like, well, he doesn't call the plays. Andy called the plays. <laughs> and it seems to me, Skip, there's only like a handful, like you mentioned. You mentioned EB, Eric Bieniemy, and you mentioned Byron Leftwich. They're the only two black OCs that I can think of off the top of my head. Now, they're, de- okay. they're, black, de- they're black coordinators on the defensive side. But, Skip, yeah. they're not going to be given the opportunities that these other, I mean, 
Dan Quinn said no, Skip. Dan Quinn said no to a job. Most assist, assistants, DCs, OCs want to be a head coach. He said, nah, I'm good. I'm, I'm where my feet are planted. Really? What black head, Skip, what black candidate you think would turn down Jacksonville? That would turn down Houston? That would turn down no. any of the vacancies that's available? Say, nah, I'm good where I'm at, bro. Okay. So, Shannon, <clears throat> help me out here. Okay. Let's look at proven black head coaching candidates. Okay. Brian Flores is at the top of my list. I would hire yes. Brian Flores in, in the next minute. If, if you gave me a team and a job to offer, I would hire yeah. Brian Flores because okay. I loved what he did at Miami. But remember, he was there three years. They didn't make the playoffs any of those three, and he went 24 and 25. Okay. So. It, when when you put him up against a white candidate, I don't know who's going to be out there. The two Dallas coordinators, Dan Quinn, obviously got a team to the Super Bowl in Atlanta. Right. Kellen Moore is the hottest young flavor of the year, obviously, is the cowboy mm -hmm. play caller. Jim Harbaugh could be on the market. And obviously, he was very good as an NFL head coach. Very good. He was. So yeah. if you put Brian Flores up against those kind of candidates, it's going to be close, right? I, right. I would still give him a shot because I believe in his toughness and his his presence. He's got head coach presence to me. I, and I love the way his defense plays every year. Look so at, okay, then skip. we moved. Let's, yeah, go ahead. OK, give a black coach the type of quarterback that those guys have. Look at what Tony Dungy did when he had Peyton Manning. Yeah. Look at what Jim Caldwell did when he had Peyton Manning. He took he Fair took a, a Matthew Stafford. Went to the playoffs, went nine and seven, and lost his job. He did. Matt Patricia couldn't okay. spell playoffs while he was in Detroit. Couldn't spell playoffs. Okay, and I'm glad you brought up Mr. Caldwell because <clears throat> he is now, <clears throat> excuse me, 66 years of age. So he started at Wake Forest and he coached for for nine years at Wake Forest and and didn't work. It didn't work. It was he was 26 and 63, but he didn't have a quarterback in it, and, and he was at a bottom rung team in that conference. So Great. then all of a sudden, guess who he got? He got Peyton Manning. Aha. Yes. 14 and 2 at Indy in his first head coaching year. Super Bowl obviously lost to um, the Saints. to Drew Brees. Okay. Yes. Then he goes 10 and 6, made the playoffs, lost to the Jets at home in a in a remember it was a Peyton Jets Rex Ryan game. Then he went 2 and 14 with no Peyton and got fired. He goes to Detroit he goes 11 and 5, 7 and 9, but 9 and 7, 9 and 7, two playoff games, did not win them, but he's 2 and 4 in the playoffs. Well, that, that's a pretty great resume. And yet, the last year he coached was 2017. He was uh, an assistant, sort of the assistant head coach to Brian Flores up to 2019 in Miami, been out right. of the game. <clears throat> I don't know. Can you sell him? I, I would. Yeah. I, I believe in him. I. I I have great respect for him. I think he can be a highly successful head coach. Go ahead. Brian, Brian Flores was trying to do him a favor. He was like, look, let me bring you on. Let me keep you in sight so people give you opportunities. Let me tell you what they did in Houston, Texas. Bill O'Brien demoted Romeo Cornell and placed the he linebacker did. coach, Mike Brable, in that position. So it would look better if Mike Brable was the D.C., he got the job in Tennessee, and then he hired Romeo Cornell back as the D.C. after demoting him to the linebacker coach. You see how they do Great that? point. Skip? You see how they I, did I that? I see. I see. Quick point about my man David Culley. Bill O'Brien got away with wrecking that franchise. He did. Basically left it for dead, and now he's rehabilitated his career because at of Alabama. his job at Alabama, and now he's a hot candidate for somebody to be an OC play caller. Okay, got right. it. That's just the way the business works. It's right. who you know and what color you are. But <laughs> okay. with David Culley, <clears throat> look at what he did. He beat Tennessee this year with nothing. nothing. He, he lost, Obviously, he didn't have Deshaun. And then he lost Tyrod to a bull hamstring. He winds up with the third-round pick rookie. Davis Mills is his quarterback. They beat Tennessee. They came within three points of beating Tennessee a second time. They came within three of New England. They beat the Chargers. They played pretty tough football. They were competitive the whole year. They went 4-13, and 13, 
But I defy you to, fa- to find anybody else who could have done any better than four and 13. And as you said, it was like fate a complete. He, it, it was, he was fired before he was hired. They just right. wanted a bridge to wherever, right? Right, yes, a bridge okay. one ba- a bad situation. Because Bill, like bad you situation said, Bill next. O'Brien wrecked that situation. Remember, Bill O'Brien wrecked, you remember, Skip, I know you don't know this, but Rick Smith, I know Rick Smith because he was with me in yeah. Denver. We called him Slick. He was. He did a great job. Yeah. Look at the players that he drafted from Dwayne Brown to J.J. Watt to uh, Deshaun Watson to DeAndre Hopkins yeah. with a uh, uh, merciless. Look at the guys he drafted and look at the Fred and pool. He got into a power struggle. He needed to step down because his wife, Tiffany, was battling cancer. Now, she ultimately lost mm. that battle, Skip. He ain't been heard from since. Now, he's tried. I've no. been talking to Slick over the last couple of days, Skip, and he's trying to get back in. But he did a great job. But Bill O'Brien, wanting the power struggle, the, uh, the McNairs gave him that. He ruined your franchise. He goes he to Alabama because that's what Coach Saban does. Coach Saban is the greatest re- rehabilitation center in all of sports. You look at every coach that's been an offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator and see what they did. From Jimbo Fisher to Kirby Smart to Lane Kiffin Great to Willie point. Napier to Gosley to Bill O'Brien yep. to Brian Dayball. Skip, I can go on and on. He, he's better than Betty Ford. He's better than, 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 than the, uh, the one up in Malibu. If you want to rehabilitate yep. your life, your career, and you're in the coaching profession, go see Coach Saban down in Tuscaloosa. Okay. Brings me to Todd Bowles. I'm a big fan of Todd Bowles. I think he's as fine a defensive mind as there is this side of Belichick, and I think he's in the ballpark with Belichick. Yes. He got his shot, as you said, with the Jets, and it wasn't great. They had a 10-6 and six year to start but didn't make the playoffs. Then he goes 5-11, and 5-11, and 4-12. and 12. It's hard to sell it back, and it brings me to – Almost my pet peeve about your game, Shannon, and I've been covering it for years. It's impossible to know how a coordinator will be as a head coach. It's the craziest phenomenon because who's the hot coordinator? What does that mean? Just because you can run a defense or call plays doesn't mean you can be a CEO of a football team. Some can, some can't, but it's hard to feel it and know it, and yet, Todd Bowles, I would give another shot to because I believe in him as a leader of men. I I believe he could be a very good head coach, better than a lot of the the candidates out there. And real quick, Marvin Lewis was really good as a head coach. He's only 63 years of age. You say, oh, that's No, it's not too old. And and he was 16 years in Cincinnati, seven times in the playoffs, did not win a playoff game. But he is really good at what he does. Would I give him right. a shot? Well, well, sure I would. Leslie Frazier had a, a you know a four year run. It wasn't very good. I can't I can't push for him. Vance Joseph, the guy you know pretty well. He right. was two years in Denver, eleven and twenty one. It's hard to resell him. Um, my friend Herman Edwards hasn't done great at Arizona State. They had one eight and five year, but he was really good in the National Football League. Right. You know, would, would he at, at 64 years of age, would, would he have an interest again? These, these guys are proven to me with the Jets, Herman Edwards, and with Kansas City, Herman Edwards was a playoff coach. He was really yes. good. So yes. I'm saying they're out there. Th- those are decorated head coaches to me who, who don't, like you always say, the white guys just get recycled and recycled and recycled. Right. The black coaches, once you're out, if you get a second sh- a chance, it's a miracle, Right. It, it is a miracle, Skip. But I would like to see some of these head coaches get them a Joe Burrow, and yep. I would like to okay. see. I would like to see the Chargers give Anthony Lynn another year with with Justin Herbert. You see, Skip, if you give them some That's of these, these up and coming, yep. these up and coming, well, hell, I mean, uh, uh, the guy should do good in in, in uh, Cincinnati with Joe with a Joe Burrow and what they got. Look yeah. at the receiving core. Look at that young team. You look at. What, I'm trying I to agree. figure out how Brandon Staley ain't winning more. He got all these guys in the Pro Bowl on offense. But his defense is the same thing they showed him short question. last year under A. Lynn with Gus Bradley. Very good question. All I'm saying, Skip, is okay. that you got to get – if you say, well, look, he's not getting it done, look at what he's trying to get it done with. Vance Joseph, how the hell are he going to win with those quarterbacks in that situation with a Drew Locke or whomever else he had? Yeah. They don't get the benefit of the doubt. David Caldwell – you skip – excuse me, David Caldwell. Jim Caldwell, they say, well, that was Peyton, that was Peyton. Okay. Peyton got a lot of coaches head coaching jobs. Yeah. How the hell you think Adam Gaines got, got a job? Ain't got another job. Yep. 
I agree. Bottom line to this, you, you can't hold Commissioner Goodell responsible because he can't legislate this. He, he can't, can't mandate it. No, by no, by rule, anything. he can't say, you must, you must, no. you must. He can tell them they have to interview, 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 the right. Rooney rule, but you can't tell an independent operator and owner of a football team, you have to hire a black head coach. It's, right. it, it, I'm sorry. It's up to those men who own, and most of them are privileged, older white men, to do right. the right thing when the right thing presents itself. When, when there's a viable candidate, say, hey, I can win with him. And again, right. back to your point, am I going to feel comfortable having a beer with him or having dinner with him? I, I don't know. Me personally, yeah, I do, but I'm different. I'm correct. I, I can't speak for these guys. I, I can't. It, it's hard to to drive home the thrust of this of just how bad they look, and yet they just continue to look worse and worse, and it doesn't bother them a bit. They own. They operate their rules. Skip, it's hard. It's hard to see how bad you look when you're looking out of a quarter billion dollar yacht. When you're looking at a $50 million home, you don't see how bad you look. And guess what? You don't I particularly agree. care either. No mercy. Skip's Cowboys look to continue their surprising season on Sunday as they host the 49ers in one of the NFC wildcard matchups. Dallas will have Micah Parsons back on the field after the front runner for defensive rookie of the year missed last week due to COVID protocols and will need him as the Cowboy defense will have their hands full with the 49ers' stout rushing attack. So, Shannon, today is the day. Tell me who wins and what is the score. That's who wins. And you're going to be disappointed on Monday, Skip Bayless, and Kyle Shanahan is going to make sure of that. I've been knowing him since he was a teenager, probably like 13. Got something for you. And I got something Good. for you on Monday. But anyway, it's going to happen, yeah. Skip. Look, I expect the 49ers to be able to run the football. They average 140 yards a game rushing the football the last nine games. That top five running attack. Um, I think they finished seventh in rushing this year. But we know nobody is more creative in the run game than one Kyle Shanahan. He attacks all areas of the field via the running game. Be it running the football with Mitchell, handing it off to Mitchell, tossing it to Mitchell, maybe just uh, jet sweeps or handing it off to uh, Debo Samuel. They find ways to get to situations where it's very favorable to them. What they're going to try and do, and you know this, everybody knows this, they're trying to minimize Jimmy Garoppolo's involvement in the game plan. All things being equal, they would like to run the ball 40 times and, and have Jimmy throw it 15, 20 times. That would be ideal. That's going to be up to the Cowboys if you can stop the run and force them to be able to throw the ball more than 20 times in the ball game. But I expect them to run the football. That front seven can cause your offensive line problems. You're not the same offensive line you once were. You know that, yeah. I know that. Nick Bosa, Armstead, Arden Key, Fred Warner, that front seven is as good as we have in the National Football League. They can get to home with four without sacrificing their back end, which I believe is a weak link of their team. Now, if you can hold up, you should have some success. You got nice receivers. Amari Cooper is playing well. C.D. Lamb has been down the last couple of weeks, but I like the Cedric Wilson situation and your two tight ends, Blake Jarwin. I really like Schultz. But I don't believe you're going to be able to hold up on a consistent basis. I don't trust your guy because unlike he won't admit it, but he's been on a roller coaster this year. I expect him to probably start like this and spend a lot of time doing that. So I got the 49ers mm -hmm. skip winning this ball game 27-26. And you know what happens? Jerry said it. Your guy Greg the leg. Misses a 50-yarder that would have won the game. He pulls it left, and the 49ers move on. 49ers 27. 20. That, what? 27 what? to 26? Yep. That's all the guts you got? That's that's all the courage of your conviction that you have? 27 on, to 26? Make it 40 to 17. The, the, Come on. on. Let, put let, you, let, put your <laughs> do where your mouth is. Let me, let me ask you a question. Who's favored in this ball game? Who's the home field? Who won, who, won the, who won the division? Who has, oh, my team is number one in sco points scored, number one in offense. Uh, we got, we take the ball away. We intercept it. Turnover margin. We're number one. Why are you on the, why are you going to need to ask yourself, 
Why are you on the losing end when you boast all of that? Number one and third, mm. number two and third down conversion against. You're going home on Sunday. Book it. Somebody is scared. Somebody I'm listening to right now is starting to get a little queasy because somebody knows what somebody's about to experience, a big old L right on your forehead. You're going to have the worst Monday on Undisputed you have ever had to the point I'm not sure you will show up on Monday. I believe you are right here right now whistling through the graveyard. You know what's coming. The graveyard is coming for you. So to to drive home my point to you, I'm going to give you a quick history lesson about 49ers Cowboys. These two franchises have taken turns over the many years of reversing franchise fortune at each other's expense. Yep. I can hark back to 1972, the greatest Cowboy quarterback ever. Roger Staubach made his reputation as Captain Comeback. He was also Captain America, but Captain Comeback with a miraculous 30 to 28 come from behind victory over the 49ers. In 1992, after that season, I was there, flew out on the team plane to creepy old Candlestick Park. And I watched the Dallas Cowboys break through one year too early, one year before anybody saw them coming. The Jimmy Jerry Cowboys broke through against the 49ers, heavily favored Steve Young, Jerry Rice, 30 to 20 Dallas on the way to trouncing Buffalo in the Super Bowl. Then, I, I'm sorry, I skipped over the, the catch game was another reversal of 1982, obviously. Yeah, I know why you obviously. would. I know it wasn't yeah. no controversy. Well, I know I, why you would skip over it. You know, it, it, it's the greatest game I ever attended because I was in the front row of the press box. It was also the most painful Cowboy memory I have because Dwight Clark went up in the fog over an undrafted rookie from Grambling named Everson Wallace and snatched it out of the fog, a pass that Joe Montana later admitted he was trying to throw, to throw out of away. bounds. He was. Yeah, 28-27, 49ers. Reversal of fortune. Then Dion became a 49er. They broke through, won the Super Bowl. Dion went to Dallas the next year. We broke back through and won the Super Bowl. You know how it's been going. Yeah. It is time for a reversal of fortune. An era is about to end for the 49ers. It should have ended earlier this year. Obviously, Kyle Shanahan decided it's time with some help from his father that you played for, Mike. It's time to go forward with Trey Lance. They gave their future for Trey Lance, who was not quite ready. He injured his throwing hand, and they they just sort of tried to muddle through with Jimmy G. He got them to a Super Bowl. He got them to 20 to 10 leading in the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl. And right on cue, he unraveled. He was the reason they lost the Super Bowl. And he is about to be the reason they lose at Dallas. (laughs) You can give him credit for being the reason that they won at the Rams, but they psychologically own the Rams. They have interdivision. They have the Rams number. That doesn't impress me at all or scare me at all because my team is just better than the 49ers. You rattle off the stats, but they're glaring. They're staring you right back in the face. Number one in points scored, number one in yards, number one on defense in third downs allowed, number one in takeaways, number one in turnover differential, the most telling stat in all of football. And I'm even going to throw this one at you. The football outsiders for whom I have respect their their classic stat their most telling stat is dvoa it's a defensive based stat the adjusted defense and points and value added guess who is number one in their their whole season of analysis their whole season of breakdown says dallas is number one in a defensive based stat it is screaming at you that the most nuclear firepower on both sides of the ball belongs to my Dallas Cowboys right here, right now. Obviously, they have to live up and play up to that. They won't. But they will. Hey, Shannon, it boils down to this. I have 11 from heaven, and you don't. You're stuck with Jimmy Garoppolo. I've got Micah Parsons. I'm sorry. Both teams, when they walk on the field for warm-ups, they'll look around and say, "Uh uh-oh, that guy. Micah Parsons is the difference maker. San Francisco doesn't have a Micah. San Francisco's back end on defense. Hey, I'm sorry. They're back in their corners. Even their safeties are below average. They are yes. torchable. Yes, that's the weakness I have of the a, defense. Okay, I have a quarterback who is better than your quarterback. 
My quarterback, Ray and Dakota Lee. Prescott, he, he's just better. Look at his three playoff performance. They are outstanding, dare I say. A 77 average QBR in three playoff games. Played Aaron Rodgers, throw for throw, got it to 31 all, and, and lost it on intergalactic hand of God field goals by Mason Crossbar. Th- threw for 305 and three touchdowns against Green Bay as a rookie. Beat Aaron, uh, uh, but Russell Wilson d- outplayed Russell Wilson in a home playoff game. And and then outplayed Jared Goff in the Rams, played well enough to win that game and lost it 30 to 22. So Dak has played two home playoff games. This one is at home. This is not his first rodeo. He will just be better than Jimmy G will be. Jimmy G turns into Jimmy so, Gag huh? right on cue. You know okay. it and I okay. know it. So I have the better quarterback. I have the defensive difference maker. And it's it's time for Jimmy G to go on to his next life, wherever it is. Whoa. The franchises are about to reverse. Jimmy G will not be a 49er next year. He'll be elsewhere. He'll be somebody's starter or backup. God bless him. But this is the end of his era in San Francisco. You know it and I know it. So I'm going to hark back to my favorite 49er Cowboy game. I'm going to go with the score of that breakthrough game by the Jimmy Jerry Cowboys following the 92 season when they upset Steve Young and Jerry Rice. 30 to 20 Dallas Cowboys this time at home. We march on. You lose more cases. What are we up to now? We got seven on it right now. Seven cases. We sure do. Would you like to make it eight? Before I answer that question, I'm just trying to figure out, why do you care if Jimmy G is somewhere else? Why do you care if he's a backup or a starter on another team? But before, guess what? He going to give you a nice parting gift on his way out the door. That's the kind of guy he is. He's going to give you a nice parting gift. That's a home ticket to the, that's a home. You're going home. Get those trash bags, those hefty bags on Monday, and you're going to be packing, you're going to be cleaning out your locker, and it's going to be another disappointing season because Jerry has already told you and the entire Cowboy Nation, it's Super Bowl or bust. You're going to go bust. You're not going to the Super Bowl. And you just rattle off all those stats. We're number one in this. We're number one in that. And we got Michael from heaven and the Marauders and this and that. Why don't you go? Why don't you say they win by four, three touchdowns? Go for Go 40 to 17. <laughs> I got them covering, right? I got them winning by 10. That's pretty impressive. I got right? the 49ers winning, and I ain't taking none of your stinking points. How about that? Okay. How about eight cases? Going once. Done. 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 Thank you. Done. Done. Thank you. Done. I, I, I'll take 10, but right now we'll, we'll leave it at <laughs> eight. And right now, everybody's going to make the case that, oh, the 49ers can run Dallas off the field. And I'm looking at Pro Football Focus, your favorite website. And wait a second. They ranked the 49er rushing attack this year 19th best in the NFL. And in rush yards allowed per game, Dallas moved up to 17th. So I think that's a standoff. I, I, I think we're good enough that we can hold you to a low roar. And my quarterback is going to throw a party on your back end of your defense. And my offensive line pass blocks a lot better than it run blocks. So I do not think that you will terrorize Dak Prescott, as you say you will. All I know is that your guards are in trouble. Armstead is going to eat your guards' lunch. He's going to take their lunch money. Whatever they they brought to the game, they will not have it when they leave because Armstead is going to take all their change. He's going to turn them upside down and shake the change out of their pocket because he knows they're holding on to it. You're going home. That defensive line got something from Dak and something for Dak. It's hard to throw the ball to C.D. and Amari and Cedric Wilson and those tight ends when you flatter your back. Mm. Would you like to make it nine cases? Throughout the course, we're going we're gonna to build. We're going to eventually get to the 10 because I want to be free and clear of my debt with the Cowboys, <laughs> the one that you won. For a win of the division, is that I'm about to been? get that back. Yeah. I'm about to get that back in in, in one show. I'm gonna get ten cases. Really? What took you the whole you year to get? Be... I'm about to get it back in one show. You gotta learn Would you your like lesson to make it here 11? with these high numbers. No, nope, all right, nope. we're I'm, sticking I'm with We're gonna break even. <laughs> right now, maybe we'll get to ten. I cannot wait for Monday. I don't know. One of you is gonna be 
so happy. And the other one, I don't know, might not show up. We'll have to see. So sad. Moving on for now, guys. A former teammate of Antonio Brown is sticking up for how his departure went down. Well, Sean McCoy was on a podcast and, and explained how last year in Tampa, he and AB saw how the Bucks offense prioritized helping players hit their incentives near the end of the season. But when that situation didn't play out in his game against the Jets this year, McCoy assumed AB was thinking, I can't get my eight catches and you're throwing the ball to all these other people. I'm hot. I'm hurt. I'm not going in. Y'all ain't getting me the ball. I ain't hitting my targets. I'm hurt. Some strong words there, Shannon. Any truth to what LaShawn said? Hell no. Skip, there are a lot of guys that don't reach their incentives. Chris Jones needed one sack in order to get $1.25 million. He didn't take his pads off and throw them up in the stands. He didn't walk off. He didn't strip down to, to his, his bare chest, pieced out, started doing jumping jacks in our head. There are a lot of guys. If you just read over the last week, there are a lot of guys that didn't reach their incentives. Let me tell you what Tampa did, Skip. And Dominican Sue needed to play 65% of the snap. He had played 64.14% of the snap. They tore that up so he could reach it and then put more incentives so he could get it because he played so well and he was a model citizen. You see what he did? See, I need A.B. and all these other supporters of A.B. to get together like me and my brother used to do. We would do something and we were like, okay, Shannon, let's get together, get our lives straight so when we tell Granny, we tell Papa, there's no conflicting stories. We get together, get the lies straight, and then we were cool. Now, Skip, he said they were messing with the man bread. He ain't mentioned nothing about he was hurt, did he? <laughs> he said nothing about, yeah. about A.B. was hurt. That's why he didn't get in the city. He said they messing with his man Brad. Now, somebody lying. Was he hurt and couldn't go in the game? Or they were jocking around with the, the, the targets and he couldn't get his incentives? Again, where is the culpability, Skip? So let's just say for the sake of argument, they were jocking him around. What about those three games he missed for the fake vaccine? Whose fault was that? He bl- Is that B.A.'s fault? Is that Tom Brady's fault? Maybe that was his boy, Gronk. Everybody else got the vax. So why you jocking around? Why you mess up your own money and then you blame somebody else? He even said, Shady even said, he had never been on a team. I had never heard this either. And I only been on two teams, but I played 14 years, Skip. I've never had coaches ask, man, what incentives you got? Because we got to make sure you get those. They was asking the players, what incentives do you have so we can help you reach those said incentives. If that's the case, why would they jock A.B. around? A.B. made it seem like it was his last game. Did he remember, does he, did he realize, Skip, they had a whole second half and an entire another game in which Mike Evans reached his incentives, in which Rob Gronkowski reached his incentives? Does he? I don't, I don't get it. One minute, he's upset because he wasn't getting targeted. He wasn't getting the incentives. He ain't mentioned nothing about A.B. being hurt. And B.A. made him go and try to make him go in the game because he was hurt. You see, all along, what you and I have been saying all along, this was never about no injured ankle. This was always about them targets, them catches, and yep. getting that money. This, that's what it's always been. That's what it's always going to be. And they tried to sell you a bill of good. Man, that man tried to make A.B. play on an injured ankle. A.B. wanted to play on the injured ankle because he needed the incentives. And once he wasn't getting the targets, he like, man, I ain't going in the game because, like he said, I'm good. I ain't getting the ball, so why am I going in there and playing? So yep. miss me with this. I do not side with Shady McCoy on this one, nor would I ever, because even if that was the case, you should act a certain way. If you think stripping off your pads throwing your gloves up in the stands, throwing your shirt up in the stands, and piecing out and doing jumping jacks before you hit the tunnel is acceptable. <laughs> it is not. It's never been about that injured ankle. It was always about the money. Skip, what do they always say? Follow the money. And the money yeah. will tell you what's really going on. <sighs> okay. I know LaShawn. I like LaShawn a lot. I know his brother. I like his brother. But as you say, LaShawn, you can miss me with this because you lost me on this (laughs) one. LaShawn did play there last year at the end of the year, so he has a feel for what that locker room is like. Correct. He has said nothing but great things about Tom Brady. Even said, I think in this same podcast, 
Brady's the greatest leader, teammate that he's ever played with. If Brady tells you you can walk on water, you just feel like you can walk on water because, yeah. in part, he can. Yeah. Okay, we get that. But when we start talking about having sympathy for A.B. because he wasn't getting enough targets in the first half after he had just gotten 15 that got him 10 catches for 101 yards at Carolina in the previous week, his first week back. It's just so wrong-headed because it wasn't like he got no targets. He, he had gotten five targets in the first half and caught three of them, which is not outrageously wrong. And LaShawn went on to say, hey, I respect Mike Evans. I respect Chris Godwin. Obviously, Chris was gone by then. But, right. but he's saying all the rest of the receivers are no A.B. OK, I'll buy that, right. except for one. That tight end <laughs> yeah. is up there. That tight end yeah. is the goat of tight ends, yeah, of, according to you, a Hall yeah. of Fame tight end. Yeah, yeah, Gronk is still Gronk. All, all Tom was trying to do, he wanted to beat the lowly Jets at the Jets. They had risen up and trying to pull off the big upset. They were off to a hot start. And all he was saying was, hey, as you pointed out the next day on Undisputed, there's Single and Gronk. I, I got him. Thank you. I I'll throw it to him. So he threw him six balls in the first half. And he caught five of them for whatever it was, 80-some yards. 80 yards. And 80 yards. Okay. And... That seemed to outrage A.B., who said something over on the bench to Tom about, oh, so Gronk's your boy again. Well, as we both pointed out the day after the, the game back at Carolina, look out. You just spoiled him rotten. You just showed him you're the savior. We need you. We don't have Godwin anymore. I'm going to force feed you the ball. Well, A.B. started to think, I'm the whole show. The offense now revolves around me. And, and in the first that. half, yeah, I know, I got it. But in the first half, it didn't quite revolve around him, but it also didn't completely ignore and eliminate him. Right. So the point was that there's no reason to throw a fit, a tantrum, and, and, and peace out. Yet, you, you, you got to let it play out because trust me on this. I believe that Tom had an even bigger soft spot in his heart for A.B. than he does for Gronk because he had doghouse Gronk for a couple of games because in the New Orleans nightmare, remember, he threw him, what was it, 11, 11 balls, 11. 11 balls, and he caught two for 12. And then in that Carolina game, he threw him only two balls, and he lost two one times. in the sun or it went right through his hands in the back of the end zone. By the way, that was the eighth drop pass for Tom Brady in the end zone this year, which is why he should be the MVP, hands down, case closed. So, but so that's Skip, another story for another day. Go so ahead. In other words, so in other words, Gronk should have took out that 87, started throwing it, and, and hit him with the piece out. <laughs> Tom only threw Tom threw me 11 targets one Bingo. week and only threw me two the next yeah. week. Skip, it Bingo. happens. I told you the story what happened to me. I needed 120 yards for 100,000. Yep. I got six catches, a buck 15, and two <laughs> touchdowns in the first half. Go look it up and didn't catch another pass. I didn't mm. take no pads off. I didn't take nothing. It happens. But Skip, Shady McCoy said something what you just echoed. He said, those dudes hurt. Now you need me. You see, A.B. thought they needed him. Last year, he was a luxury. Last year, he was a luxury. He now runs. he feels yep. he's a necessity. You got to feed me now. You got to come see your boy. Tom said, hold on. You see how they're letting Gronk run up and down the field? We saw Carolina skip, and I, we came in the next. I said, hold on. Any defense that allows Gronk to roam free up the seams is a bad defense. Well, the Jets was doing the exact same thing, letting him roam the seams, letting him run the over routes, unfettered. So Tom said, yeah, I'm going to give him the ball. The man 20 yards down the field with nobody on him. I'd be foolish not mm -hmm. to throw it to him. A.B., Shady McCoy, no A.B. was wrong with this. Skip, A.B. can still be your boy. He can still be your boy. If you're telling me wrong, just tell him he's wrong. In this situation, A.B., you wrong for this. The way you handled it, knowing that Tampa, the coaches asked, who got incentives? What you need? We're going to make sure you get that. Mike Evans, they had everything sold up. They couldn't move up or down. He needed 40 yards. 
They got him 46. Go sit down. And Dominic and mm. Sue, they tore the contract up, gave him the 200000 and said, now you can make even more money. Just go keep doing what you're doing, son. That's all you have to do. But what did A.B. do? What A.B. always does. He can't get his way, so now, Skip, I'm going to buck. I'm going to take off my stuff. Mm. I'm going to throw it. I'm going to do some jumping jacks, and then I'm going to piece y'all out. And then I want y'all to feel sorry for me because I'm going to tell you he tried to put me in the game when I was injured, and I didn't want to go in there. But Shady McCoy just said it was about the incentives. He was mad because they wouldn't give him those targets. Now, somebody lying. I told you, yeah. Skip, get your stories together. So, therefore, when they separate you, you don't have conflicting stories. Well, he said this. That's how they do it on the first 48. They get them apart. They don't let y'all sit in the same interrogate room because they're going to know you're going to get your stories together. So, we separate you. Mm. And now, yep, let's see I if he you. said you left the house at 930 as opposed to 1230. Well, let me see. Shady, was that, how was that? How was AB ankle? Man, AB ankle mm -hmm. had been hurting. Man, the AB, that, man, you know, I talked to AB. No, you said you understood because they weren't getting that man that rock. With Chris God, with Godwin down uh, uh, and uh, Mike Evans being Nick and those backup, that's some good backup, but they ain't AB. See? Yeah. Now AB should be getting all the targets because those other guys, like, the other guys ain't Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. Gotcha. Sh Shannon. Tom Brady asked Antonio Brown to live with him in Foxborough, to live with him in Tampa. Mm -hmm. That's how much he believed in him and cared about him. So, you know, and I know, A.B. was going to get plenty of sugar. He was going to get whatever incentives he could get with the time left to get them. Tom would have gotten them for him. And yes. I point out that in that final game, Bruce Arians went over to Brady and said, that's it, you're done. Tom said, no, I'm not done. Grabbed his helmet and defied the head coach, went back in the game, called a play for Gronkowski and threw him one more pass. A design play, just a little quick. Flat route. Right. Just it, quick, quick it, flat yeah, route. Just a flat. Like it's just, it's just nothing. It's a nothing yeah. route for yeah. one yard or whatever, and that's it. You got your incentive. He would have done that and more for Antonio, but, but he just couldn't. He just couldn't accept how great he had it. Skip, do you remember A.B. missed the first eight games last year? Needed to have a yep. spectacular last eight games. Tom Brady forced fed the man and got him $1.3 the last game. So Tom Brady going to do that. Now Tom Brady's going to go against you. The man just got you $1.3 after you missed eight games. He did that for you, A.B. Do you not understand how that works? Mm. But... He could, it's Skip, called, he could, yeah. Go ahead, Skip. What were you going to say? Dude, this is biting the hand that has fed you and fed you and fed you. Go ahead. He, he just couldn't help himself, Skip, because somebody had told him no. He wasn't getting what he thought. Now, mind you, he had gotten five targets. He was averaging about six targets at a half. So he got one fewer targets than what he normally get, and he acted a damn fool. I can see, Skip. First of all, I can't see. But let's just say for the sake of argument, you want to you want to side with A.B. He's used to getting six targets. He got no targets. He got one. Skip, he normally gets six. He got five. With a whole half to go and another game. Did he realize that he still has six quarters to get those five catches? That he had six quarters to still get that 50 yards? Now, he probably, 60 yards, he probably wasn't going to get three touchdowns. But mm. he could have got 666,000. Which yep. last I checked, six seven six six thousand dollars ain't no chump change. That could change. Yeah, that could do. That could help something. But so Shannon Sharp, fi final question: What would have helped AB's NFL career more to continue on with Tom Brady and win a second straight Super Bowl this time as his featured target, or to melt down and peace out? W which would help more? <clears throat> uh, Skip, <clears throat> Skip. Let me t let me tell you what I believe. I believe if Antonio Brown had been on his best behavior and they won another Super Bowl, they were going to be done with Antonio Brown. I believe the fake vaccine Maybe. was the final straw for them. They were going to get through the season, Skip. They were going to do a stop. They were going to do a patchwork job. Let's just do this. Hey, we're going to duct tape the muffler just so we can get from point A to point B, but we realize we're going to need okay. to get off this car. I believe that's what was going to happen with Antonio Brown. 
because they a, 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 a BA saw this coming. BA, BA's like, well, I don't have any reason to doubt it. Be like, well, hold on, bro. Why would you give us a fake vaccine card and then go get the vaccine? Skip, what sense did that make? Why the hell are you going to go get fake ID, show the man the fake ID and say, nah, well, here you go, man. Here is my real ID. <laughs> if you do that, Skip, if the police officer pull you side the road and you give him the fake ID, you say, nah, give me that one back. That's the fake one. Here, let me give you the real one. They're going to take you to jail. AB, you gave the yeah. man a fake vaccine card first. Then you went and got the real vaccine and said, no, go. I'm good. Yeah, he done. No. He, he, it doesn't work that way. It, it doesn't work that way. No mercy. Oh, guys, listen up here, because the Michael Jordan, LeBron James GOAT debate has been going on for years. We know it well on this show, but D-Wade thinks that the argument will fall by the wayside sooner than later. On a new podcast with free time, NBA champ said, quote, we're not going to be the ones having a conversation about the GOATs. Now it's going to be the younger, younger, younger generation, and they're going to forget about Jordan like we forgot about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So, Shannon, how much truth is there to what D. Wade is saying here? Skip, I believe there's a little truth to it, Skip. I do believe that over time it gets more difficult because of people that you didn't see. Skip, I, and I, a lot of times I preface like I never saw Will or I never saw Oscar Robinson, or I never saw Elgin Baylor, some of the all-time greats that were playing before I, I, I was even alive. And when I was alive, I didn't, mm-hmm. we didn't have TV, and we didn't get the opportunity to see the games because they weren't on television. So I'm one of those guys, and I believe uh, uh, D. Wade is right to a certain extent. But here's the thing that Jordan has working in his favor that Kareem didn't. The Jordan brand. Skip, uh, they still make those Jordan shoes, right? You, you got a pair on today, right? They still make it, though. (laughs) When Kareem retired, they no longer made a Kareem Adidas. They used to, Kareem Mm -hmm. used to wear Adidas, top 10 Adidas. And they no longer had the Kareem Adidas. They still made Adidas, but not the Kareem Adidas. Jordan has a brand, the logo. And plus, Skip, he's put out documented. Now, Tom Brady's doing a great thing, Skip. You see the man in the arena? You see the docuseries that Tom is putting out for what? The last, what, four or five weeks? I think he did it a couple of times last year. And he has a documentary that he put uh, that he put out with Gotham. I think it was Gotham Chopra, Skip. I think that's who he put it out with. Yep. So mm-hmm. he has a little bit. They're gonna have a little bit more staying power where Kareem would didn't didn't have that. He didn't do that. And plus, it's because of the Jordan flair. You know, you see a lot of guys. They're like, man, that was very Jordan esque. That was a Jordan esque performance. Skip, when last time you heard somebody say, man, that was like Kareem. Man, he threw that guy hook like Kareem. We see that mid range. You talk about the mid range. Man, that mid-range, man, that Jordan, even Jordan had that mid-range. The skip. Now, what does everybody do, Skip, after they shoot a shot? Hold it. Man, put your arm down and get back on defense. So there's a little truth to it, Skip, but I think Jordan's going to have a, a lot more staying power because even now, Skip, there are a lot of people, Babe Ruth is not people's GOAT anymore because people didn't see Babe Ruth. Now they think Mike Trout or this guy here or that guy there. And I think, oh, now it's going to be, Probably the next, not this next five, 10 years, but probably 20 years, 30 years from now, Skip, probably people will be talking about the KDs and the LeBron, maybe even a Steph Curry as far as GOAT. Kobe will still be in that discussion because hopefully Vanessa and Nike can come to some kind of group agreement and they start remaking the Mambas. But Skip, D-Wade has a, has a very valid point now because people don't realize you do because you were here in L.A. You remember Kareem. You remember how great Kareem was. A lot of people don't remember Kareem because when they saw him, like, when Ma- after, like, three years after Magic got there, he was in, like, year 15, year 16. But his first 12 years, he was a monster. Okay, to your first point, <clears throat> as we speak, as I sit here, <laughs> I, am, I am not wearing Kareem's. I'm wearing Jordans. I I have never worn Kareem's in my life. I I know those Adidas. I know what they look like. I I did have some that I wore, but they weren't Kareem's. Right. Back in the day. Stan Smith. You probably had Stan Smith. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't go that far back, but you're you're a little older than I am, so you know those. So (laughs) man, if people wear Stan Stan Smith right now. Okay, good. I wear Jordans. I live in Jordans, and I believe they will live on past me that they're yeah. not only a brand they're they're iconic <clears throat> they are it they are the destination for 
five year olds and seven year olds and 12 year olds. They want J's. Everybody wants J's and they just keep turning them out. I can't keep up with them. They keep <laughs> reinventing the, re- the ones the, 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 the you know, just every the other level. week. There's a, a new one's being dropped with, with a whole new style about it, a, a whole new design. It, it's it's stunningly great. And it, and it just keeps it getting bigger and bigger. It, it feels bigger now than it ever did. And it does help his staying power. Mm-hmm. Now, back to Dwayne. <clears throat> I love Dwayne Wade. I was a huge fan of Dwayne's as a player, even pre-LeBron. And I loved what Dwayne did for LeBron because when LeBron did join forces, leave Cleveland for Miami, take his talents to South Beach, Dwayne was the best thing that ever happened to LeBron because Dwayne just showed him the ropes. He, he, he taught him how to overcome any fears, any doubts, and to tough through it and to win championships. He, he just, he taught him how to be a superstar at the highest level, how to be a winner. And I love Dwayne for that, and, and I cherish that as part of basketball history. But now Dwayne is still obviously LeBron's best friend, but he's a business partner of LeBron's. And when LeBron does decide to walk away, he and Dwayne will still be attached at the hip in business and entertainment. So you, you have to qualify or sometimes disqualify some of the things Dwayne says. The reason this was so offensive to me that at some point we'll just forget about Michael Jordan because the generations will change and he will fade away. I mean, Dwayne grew up in Chicago in the golden era of Jordan. Like like Jordan was his salvation. He Jordan was his God, his basketball God that that everything Dwayne did was inspired by Jordan. So it, it, it's offensive to me that he would try to make the LeBron goat case by just saying it's generational. And you always say, well, some people love LeBron, some love Jordan. But, but in the end, you, you can't just, you can't disqualify Michael Jordan just because he played, really his last year was 1998. And right. as we saw in the last dance, you can't just say that was a long time ago, so that doesn't count anymore. It did count. It does count. And Dwayne knows in his heart of hearts who the GOAT is. It's Michael Jeffrey Jordan. I'm sorry. He will live on. And my last point before I throw it back to you. As much as I admire what Kareem did, I covered his Lakers team in 77 and 78. I was there. Shannon, they weren't that great. Kareem won a championship with the great Oscar Robertson in Milwaukee, came to L.A. Yeah. And and for four years in L.A., the first year they missed the playoffs with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And then for the next three years, they were they were just pretty good, but they didn't win anything. No. Until that guy, until Jerry Buss stole Magic Johnson. I don't know how they did it, but they got magic. And when magic walked in that door, life changed for Kareem, because in the end, Kareem was more of a follower than a leader. He just wanted to do what he did every night, which was great. It was skyhook great. But but well, the driving force of that team was Magic Johnson. I don't care what no, anybody says. Yeah. There's no question about that, Skip. But you know it's hard for a big to be the leader because he doesn't have the ball in every possession. Magic Johnson okay, was more important enough. because Magic had the ball all the time. Skip, and I don't think it's not like D-Wade said that LeBron is the GOAT. He's just saying, Skip, it's like if you think about it, look at these younger guys. They say Randy is the GOAT over Jerry. Now, a lot of these people didn't see Jerry play or saw the tail end of Jerry's career. But you saw Jerry. You know what Jerry was. You look at the numbers. The numbers speak for themselves. You look at the playoff numbers. You look at the regular season numbers, the catches, the yards, the touchdowns. The man has 208 total touchdowns. Name name the position player that's gonna name the position player that's gonna have two hundred eight touchdowns. So for me, Skip, plus Jordan is flat. Skip, Jordan is flashy. We, we Skip the, 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 the tongue hanging out. You mentioned the shoes. He the Jordan shoe, the cool grays, the bread. 
People wear those with tuxedo. Skip, you couldn't leave your house if you tried to put some sneakers on with a tuxedo when I was coming up. Or you better get you your butt not. back in there and put them, put them hard bottom Agreed. shoes on. Now, Agreed. they go to the Grammys, they go to the Emmys, they go to any event, and guys have on sneakers. Well, and the boy, that used to be, that was taboo. He's a, what he did for the sneaker game, yep. Skip, he made it okay. Yep. There was not an occasion in which you couldn't wear that Jordan shoe. And so that's why I believe, Skip, he's going to be different than a lot of icons that were great and people thought they were great because of what the Jordan brand is. Like you said, the symbol, the iconic, the iconic, that Jumpman logo, Skip, that's going to be there. For, that's going to stand for his kids, his kids, their kids, their kids. So I believe it's a little bit that, you know, it's going to be harder, but he's not, Jordan is never, ever going to leave because of that shoe. Because I, I never thought somebody, a guy, once he retired, Skip, will still have a shoe. What you going to sell? You not playing? How does somebody sell a shoe when they haven't played in damn near a quarter century, Skip? He doing mm. it. <laughs> he doing mm. it. I'm, I'm watching this video right now. Forgive me, uh -huh. but I'm just mesmerized by that. It's just so good. It's just Skip. so great. What a walk off was that? Whew. It, it's kind of, Skip, it's kind of like technology. People forget Graham, Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison. They think whoever invented the iPod is the greatest inventor ever. They forget about Jonas Salk and all the other vaccines that were created. They say, well, whoever invented the vaccine for COVID? That's just the way it is, Skip. But Jordan has something that these other iconic, as far as athletes, didn't have. A brand. Okay, but a logo. my question about Kareem was to Dwayne, <clears throat> whoever said Kareem was the GOAT? I, I never heard that. I covered him. I never heard anybody say that. Skip. I heard Bill Russell was the GOAT before Kareem. Well, Skip, I, I didn't really, I mean, you know, I came up and everybody loved Dr. J because Dr. J seemingly defied gravity. Um, and until I started watching Kareem and then I see all these other guys and I'm like, OK, Magic Bird, I was I'm old enough to remember that era. But I never there was never really skip a really a goat conversation until Jordan, like midway through his career, after he won those first three and he retired and came back. That's when I really started hearing the conversation goat. You know, Muhammad Ali said I'm the greatest of all time. But it was LL Cool J that actually used the acronym GOAT on his, on true. one of his albums. So for me, he Skip, did. you're right. Back then, ain't nobody talking about, well, they root the GOAT uh, or this tennis player was the GOAT. Skip, we didn't hear start talking about that until Pete Sampras broke the record and then here come Federer and Nadal and Joker. And then we talking about, well, who's the GOAT tennis player? All of them got 20 uh, uh, slams and Joker seemed to be all of them on their surface in their prime. So is Joker the goal to what? So we having that discussion. But Skip, as far as basketball, I agree with you. When Kareem was playing, when Bird and Magic, I never heard the term GOAT. I never heard it mm. until midway through Jordan's career after he won those first three. And it's like, well, is this not the greatest player that we've ever seen? Yeah. So I think in conclusion that you are finally admitting publicly that Jordan is far and away the GOAT. No, no, no. GOAT James. LeBron is the GOAT. And just like Go James, the uh, 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 the, uh, okay. the king, the little crown, the crown ain't going nowhere. That's gonna be here. He king got a lifetime what? contract. He got a lifetime contract with Nike, one billion. He, well, he, wait a second. He just lost to Sacramento. How do you do that? Uh, You're disqualified, have, phony. Uh, no, 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 hold on. You do realize when Michael Jordan went seventy-two and ten, you realize the Charlotte Bobcats beat him. The Charlotte beat him. Mm. On that 73? Nobody I, remembers. Nobody cares. <laughs> I don't agree Everybody with Everybody remembers what happened the other night in Sacramento. They do because it just happened forever. the other night. 30 years from now, yeah. they won't remember. Nobody doesn't realize that we're going to no, talk I about will. it on Undisputed until the end of time. We will always yep. have a little LeBron MJ. And I'm always going to be right. For Go. All of our viewers. No mercy. Sunday on Fox, Jalen Hurts and the Eagles look to dethrone the reigning champs as they take on the GOAT, Tom Brady and the Bucks. It all kicks off 1 Eastern with pregame coverage starting at 11 a.m. only on Fox, a part of Super Wild Card Weekend. Ooh, can't wait. Well, we know this guy's going to be in action. Dak Prescott, he is one and two in three-year playoff games and was recently ranked second 
of QBs under the most pressure in the playoffs, only behind the Rams, Matthew Stafford. However, Dak is embracing the spotlight, telling reporters yesterday, quote, I don't know why people label the word pressure as such a bad thing. I think it creates high expectations and high standards, and it usually creates high results. So, Shannon, does Dak have the most pressure on him of any quarterback in the playoffs? No, I think he has the second most pressure. I agree with the uh, the article that said Dak had the second most pressure. I believe it's Matthew Stafford. Skip, you don't mortgage your future. Remember, Skip, the Rams don't have a first-round pick, a second-round pick, a third-round pick, or a fourth-round pick. Now, they will get a third-round pick back because Brad Holmes was hired, who's a minority, to go to, uh, uh, to Detroit. But, Skip, when you give up two first-rounders and a quarterback that had taken you to the Super Bowl just three years ago, and you said, we're all in. You signed Von Miller. You signed, you signed OBJ. You gave $100 million contract to Aaron Donald, to Jalen Ramsey. You paid a, cre- a premium price for Leonard Floyd. Skip, you're winning now. And because you took a guy out of Detroit, and people was like, Matthew Staff- is Matthew Stafford really good playing on a bad team? Or are they just holding him back? Or he just putting up, or is he Matthew as uh, our guy, uh, Rob Parker would say, Matthew Padford? Because he's padding his stats. So what is it? Yep. Well, Sean McVay says, I believe he's a great quarterback just in the wrong situation. Let me have him and let me show you what I can do with him. <clears throat> Skip his immense pressure. I'm not saying Dak is not under pressure, and Dak is absolutely right. It is a privilege, it is an honor to have ex- uh, pressure, and it sets yep. great expectations, but it also sets up major disappointment. When you the greater the expectations, the greater the disappointment. It's also the greater the accomplishment, the greater the achievement, but it's a, it, it, it balances itself out. You're happy when you win. You're majorly disappointed when you lose. But Skip, for me, it's Matthew Stafford, and it's not close because no other team really had to mortgage their future in order to get their quarterback. Everybody just drafted him. I mean, you think about Dak as the fourth-round pick, Skip, they didn't have to give up anything to, to, to get uh, uh, Dak Prescott. Joe Burrow, they drafted him. Everybody else drafted their quarterback. Now, Kansas City did have to give up, but Patrick Mahomes has paid that off tenfold what they had to give up to get him. But when you give up two first-rounders, Skip, and you give up a quarterback that had just taken you to the Super Bowl and you lost, what'd you lose, 13-3? to three, That's a lot of pressure. A lot of people said Matthew Stafford was going to win the MVP this year. And that stretches, Skip, he played like an MVP. But he had never won a play. He's never won a playoff game. And the last couple of games mm. that they lost, they lost because of his play. He's mm. under immense pressure. Hmm. <clears throat> Shannon Sharp. Yep. Matt Stafford is who I thought he was. <laughs> he is who I told you he was before the year started. <laughs> he is not to be trusted. I believe that. He is about to make Ram fans miss Jared Goff because Jared <laughs> Goff was always pretty good in the postseason. Got right. you to a Super Bowl. Didn't play well in that Super Bowl, but he got you there. He beat my guy Dak, even though I thought Dak outplayed him and had a better QBR. But he did a lot of good things for the Rams that I do not think Matt Stafford will be able to pull off. And I will give you that Matt Stafford is playing in the real Hollywood. But when it comes to the National Football League, there's only one Hollywood, and it's in Texas. It's actually in North Texas because it's Dallas. It is Hollywood, Texas at Jerry World, and that's what's going to happen on Sunday. The world watches America's team. The world does not watch the Los Angeles Rams like they watch this team rise or fall. You root for or against. You love and you hate America's team. And Gerald Wayne Jones Jr., the owner and operator, the ringmaster of the Dallas Cowboys, shocked me by finally caving in and getting taken to the bank and the cleaners all at once by Dak Prescott and his agent. I didn't see it coming. I was relieved it was over and resolved one way or the other. But when I realized that Jerry had paid Dak $75 million just for this season, including his bonus. It rocked me because Dak at that point in his last 17 starts for the Dallas Cowboys was 6-11. and 
As you well know, Dak bet on himself through the 2019 season and fell on his face over the last 13 games. They went five and eight, and he was pretty pitiful in a lot of road games that year, as you recall, at New Orleans, at Jets, at Chicago. New England. At New England, at Philadelphia, I can go on and on. So he he hadn't, to me, people say he earned the 75. No, he did not. Jerry got stuck. I even, at one point, I campaigned for Jerry, go get Tom Brady. He's on the market. Just go get him. Sign him for two years, and you'll have a little better shot at winning a Super Bowl than you would if you overpay Dak Prescott. So Jerry does a press conference with Dak, and as you quickly pointed out, he looked right down the table at him and said, I overpaid you. You did? You're, you're going to admit that much, Jerry? You got me. You beat me. I overpaid you. Well, now it comes home to roost. It's one game for $75 million. Dak has had some good games because three times this year, he was the NFC Offensive Player of the Week. That right. broke the Cowboy record held by Troy Aikman. Okay, I'll give you that. But as you constantly point out to me, there have been some Denvers, and there's been some Arizonas, and there's been some Kansas Cities where you said, what the hell was that, Dak? What, where are you? And I always tell you, he can play like the fourth overall pick on some days, and he can play like the fourth rounder he was on other Sundays. It is time to live up and rise up to $75 million. So to me, I, I give you the pressure on Matt Stafford, but it it's, it's just like it's off-Broadway pressure. This is Broadway. This is America's team. Nope. This is the game. This is the one. Ever. This will have by far the highest rating. It, it, it will be more watched than the Monday night game to me. It will, it oh, will just yeah. have more yeah. magnitude. You know, yeah. it's just it. You, you know what happens when the Cowboys play. What did you tell yeah. me about the Thanksgiving game? Yeah, It's, 41, it's 40. record setting. Yeah. 40 yeah. million. OK, yeah. so there's more pressure because there are more eyeballs. Everybody is on the edge of their seats to see if Dak falls on his face or he does what he did in his previous three playoff games, which is play like he's worth seventy five million dollars. So to me, I believe he will live up, rise up, play up to his price tag. I believe in him in playoff games. And yet the pressure is extraordinary on number four. Skip, I'm not saying that the pressure is not there, but you have to understand Dak has already won a playoff game. He's 28 years of age. Matthew Stafford has never won a playoff game. He's 34 nope. years of age. And Skip, yep. I would I would agree with you. If Matthew Stafford was in it was still in Detroit, I would say ain't no pressure on him. Hell, it's Detroit. Nobody expected him to win anyway. But Skip, when you give up you give up your next two drafts. You get off a quarterback that just three years ago took you to the Super Bowl. Okay, you mentioned that I, I he beat. It. You mentioned that he beat Dak. He, he also went to New Orleans and beat Drew Drew uh, Brees before him. Drew Brees was stepped off a cliff. So the True. pressure that's on Stafford with with all they brought in, Skip. They signed OBJ. They gave up a second round pick for uh, Von Miller. So you basically like we got nothing this for the, for the upcoming draft. And you, because everybody said all the man, the Rams are a quarterback away from getting back to the Super Bowl. OK, Sean McVay went and got the quarterback that he believed could get him back to the Super Bowl. This guy was going to be an MVP. And you mentioned on some Sundays he plays like it. But if you go back and look at that Sunday night game, when he played like the Titans, <clears throat> he played like an undrafted free agent. You look at another he one did. of the game he played against Arizona Skip. He played like an yeah. undrafted free agent. So they have the highs and the lows in which he experienced this year, but he's never felt anything about what he's about to feel on Monday night. He's going to be under immense. Skip, you can't lose this game. He can't. And by the way, I'm here to predict that he and Coach McVeigh won't be sharing a hot tub after Monday night's game. Remember, that's how they sort of yeah, clicked they, and connected yeah. down in Cabo, right? right? Yeah. When they're on vacation, that's where right. the deal came together. They were hot tubbing together. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so here's my my response to what you just said. I got all that. You, you, bet, you bet your future on Matthew Stafford at age 34. Well, remember, my future got bet on 28-year-old Dak who, who didn't have near the reputation 
around the league that Matt Stafford did. Everybody from B.A., Bruce Arians on down, he can spin the football. Like, Aaron like Bruce Arians said, I, yeah, the, the Aaron Rodgers, yeah, they say, we go out to watch him warm up because of his arm talent. We just like to watch him spin the football, okay? Right. Nobody says that about Dak Prescott. And yet Jerry, he, he, he almost wrecked his cap. To me, it did. I know the cap's going to go up, so it's kind of hard to, to know exactly, yeah. but – but trust me on this, they are going to be strapped against the cap because of all the money that he guaranteed to Dak Prescott. It was stunning to me because you bet the ranch that it used to be called Valley Ranch where their headquarters were. You bet the ranch on Dak Prescott for the next four years, just the way Kansas City bet on Mahomes. But he's yep. Mahomes. Right. We're not sure about Dak being Dak. But here's the thing, Skip. If you guys lose... Guess what you're going to say? You're going to say Dak was never the same after that calf injury. You look at his numbers pre-injury, you look at his numbers post-injuries. People will find a way to excuse his play that caught if they were to lose. What's going to be Matthew Stafford's excuse? He has no injuries. Well, he's had something, and then the other day he yeah turnover. What, what was it? It was yeah. Well, it was something, but he caught his leg underneath him in that pile up, and I. I can't remember what it was. It was something about his foot. He sprained his foot or something. He's had little knickknack injuries all year. But to your it's, point, nobody's going to seize upon them and give him an out because of his right. injuries. I Skip, agree. You remember, you remember how he looked on that Monday night game against the 49ers? You saw how he looked Sunday against the 49ers. You saw him against Arizona. You saw him against Tennessee. When it goes bad for him, he really should have lost against the Ravens through a horrible pick mm -hmm. six. Through a horrible interception when the guy was triple covered. When it goes bad for him, it goes really bad. Wheels fall off. Engine drops out. The pressure yeah. of giving up those Wait two first rounds. Huh? Yeah, somebody on this show, not me, said, oh, bully for the Rams getting Matt Stafford. Somebody completely <laughs> co-signed on that move, not me. I, di I hmm. did co-sign the move because I still believe that he's better than Jared Goff. Which Sean McVay and the Rams believed that he was better than Jerry Goff. They believed so much, Skip, that they gave up two first rounders and they gave up a second rounder for Von Miller and I think a third rounder for OBJ. Mm. Hmm. That's a good point. All right. Well, <laughs> I like. Did you call it turnover itis, Shannon? Is that what? Yeah, you're that's that's what that's, that's the only thing that was wrong with him. Creative, creative. No mercy. Fox Bet Super 6 and Terry Bradshaw have given away almost $500,000 in the last three weeks. And there's still plenty more where that came from. So scan the QR code and enter the NFL Wild Card Contest for your chance to win $100,000 of Terry's money during the Eagles-Buccaneers game on Fox. It is free to play. Best of luck while you're watching this one. So speaking of that game. And what we've seen before here. The last time Tom Brady faced the Eagles in the postseason, his Patriots lost in Super Bowl 52. And Philly fans took notice that he snubbed quarterback Nick Foles for a post-game handshake. I remember it well. The seven-time champ was asked about the incident leading up to his matchup with Philly this week. Take a listen. I've shaken Nick's hand plenty of times, though. So I had a lot of respect for Nick and you know, I, I try to be a good sport as best I can. I know it doesn't always look like that because sometimes I get a little pissed out there. But for the most part, I try to be a good sport. Sometimes when he says things with that little smirk, Shannon, uh, did you. you like Brady's explanation of his behavior? No, I think Brady's full of bull jive. Uh, it's like he's trying to be a good sport, but it <laughs> seems to be he's only being a good sport when he wins. I don't judge a man in his character in a time of convenience when things are going great. You judge a man when things are less than ideal. So in other words, Tom Brady would like for you to believe that he's the only one that cares about wins and losses. That the other guys, when Tom Brady has been on the other side, he's winning. He's quick to run to the middle of the field. Like those guys are not hurting. Like those guys uh, uh, didn't invest time and energy into that ball game. And I hate the fact that guys like Skip Bayless have given him a pass far too long yeah. for this and said it's just competitive. So are you telling me Peyton Manning wasn't competitive? Are you telling me the other guys that he's beaten in moments like this aren't competitive? You and Tom Brady and a lot of the Tom Brady supporters believe competitive is mutually exclusive 
to Tom Brady. Nobody else can be competitive. And if that if you lose a game and you shake somebody's hands, that means you weren't competitive. That means that you didn't put nearly enough into it because if you had lost the game and you invested what Tom Brady did, there's no way you would have wanted to shake the guy's hand. That's bull jive. There's a lot of things that he does that gets uh, written off as that's passion, that's competitiveness, that's bull jive, and we would not let that fly. Had had uh, Cam Newton or Lamar Jackson or Kyler Murray runs to the opposing sideline and tells a coach, go bleep yourself, smashes an iPad. Boy, they'd had a, they'd had a petition, they had to get him up out of the league. He got to go. How dare you talk to somebody like that? But Tom Brady gets a pass. That's just a competitive fire. I just love that about it. That's some bull jive, and y'all know it. Mm. So, time out. You threw me a curveball there. You just went racial. So, are you saying he's getting a racial pass just of because he's white? Of course. Of course. There's no possible way that a black quarterback can do some of the things that Tom Brady did and get away with it. But here's again, I say sports are a microcosm of society because when you've accomplished a certain level of success, be it fame, be it money, you're allowed to do to treat certain people a certain way. That's how it is in society. So why should we expect it to be any other way in professional sports? What color was Michael Jordan? He was black. And how did he handle himself? When he lost. He was. What, he lost. He, he goes, was the he, worst. Yes, yeah, Skip, I get that. But let me ask you a question. At any point in time that he lost, did he not shake the hands? Remember, he got upset at Isaiah Thomas because every year that they beat him, he shook their hand as they were leaving the court. And the one time he won against Isaiah, he felt that they snubbed him and wouldn't give him the respect that he had paid them. Okay, let's go back to Brady. I have told you from the start, he is as poor a sport as we've ever seen. He's also the greatest player in your game we have ever seen. So in the end, big picture, we get back to show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. He's the worst loser. He, he's, and he comes across and, and you say it, it has phoniness to it because the guy yeah. we just saw speaking, he, he, he comes across as that lame, corny dad next door. Oh, gee, shucks. Golly, gee, I, I don't know. I get a little pissed out there. You get a little pissed? You go psycho crazy. You are psycho Tom. It was vintage Brady that he ran over to Dennis Allen, the presiding head coach and defensive coordinator. He was furious over what you had pointed out to me was a low blow that took Chris Godwin out of the game and out for the season, a a below the belt, a, a, the kind of a shot that you would never want to take as a receiver. No. And he went over and said, go, you know what yourself. And then he was so upset with the way things are going. He goes over, as we just see, and he throws a tablet like a little child. He threw a tantrum. He has thrown them before. It's the way he's operated his whole life. He, he went down in that, that game against Pittsburgh, you recall, in 2007, when that kid for the Steelers had dared to say he guaranteed a victory in Foxborough. That was the year they were trying to go, obviously, 19-0. And, and Brady threw a touchdown pass to Randy Moss early and ran all the way to the end zone and got in that kid's face. How dare you say that to me here, you know, about us here. Okay, it's just the way he Still, operates. It's I what it. drives him. It's, it's why he is what he is. Not who he is, but what he is. He's the I, GOAT. I don't believe that. I don't believe if Tom Brady lost a game and he shook somebody's hand after he lost the game, that makes him less than what he is. Skip, you remember... For the longest time, people sat in the chairs that we sit in that's not necessarily my color and criticized Cam Newton for sitting on the sideline with a towel on his head when they were losing. Yep. They criticized okay. the attire that he wears in the postgame or wearing to the game, saying he's more concerned about how his look off the field than his play on the field. If, I got it. If, if Cam I Newton or Lamar Jackson had did that, go out of their way, because Tom Brady had to run towards the, uh, uh, the uh, Saints' sideline, said what he said, would that have been okay? 
nobody would have said that's just the competitive nature of Cam Newton or Lamar Jackson. They just hate to lose so bad. But y'all chalk it up as competitiveness. Y'all chalk it up as him being, ooh, he's just a burning desire to win. That's bull jive. Hey, Shannon, trust me on this. If a white quarterback, C. Baker Mayfield, acted like this and, and didn't win, didn't live up to it, didn't back it up, you would be you, you have crushed Baker Mayfield for this type of behavior, not, not I did. shaking hands. I crushed. But, I, yeah, okay, yeah, Skip, okay. you, I, you, you I, gave I the prime it. example. Skip, he did it. You remember Hugh Jackson? You remember when Hugh was on the sideline for Cincinnati? He did. What Baker did? Yeah. That was the perfect situation. Thank you. Okay, so, Baker, so, so if Baker, Tom Brady kept acting like this and wouldn't shake hands after losses, and he never even made the playoffs, open season on Tom Brady. I don't care what color he is, there would be open season. Everybody would be after him, and they would crush him for it. But the point is, he just keeps winning Super Bowls. He just won at, won, won at eight, uh, age 43. And, and people sit back, they don't give him a pass. They just shrug and say, well, he backed it up. That's who no, he no, is yeah, back, no, and no, what skip. he's always been. So you are you saying because if a player uh, 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 achieves a certain level of success in a sport, he should be able to behave in a matter that that's okay? Okay, what about the last dance? What You, you despise the way Michael treated his teammates. And I'm saying yes. that's just who he was. It just he, he was the GOAT. He went 6-0 in the finals because of that behavior. Yeah, I, I I'm don't, not trying yeah. to... To condone it, I'm just saying that's how he did it. I do not believe. I believe Michael Jordan would have still gone six and zero had he not hit Steve Kerr in the eye. Had he not slugged no. Will Purdue, I believe Who Skip. He was. No, Skip, no, 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 Skip. That's an isolated. That, that, that's two separate issues. Because the thing was, that means so everybody, with the exception of those two guys, no one else made a mistake. No one else did anything. He didn't slug Bill Cartwright. He didn't slug Robert Parrish, and he definitely didn't step the oak. All I'm saying is about Tom Brady, Skip, is that I've never said that he wasn't great. I think he does a lot of great things, but his behavior that many brush off is being competitive and said it's because he won seven Super Bowls, and he has all this, and he has all that. I don't believe that gives you the right to act like a jerk. That's all. I'm not. That's it for me. I just, I, I, I don't believe that. I hear you guys. I hear both sides of the argument both of you guys are making. So we're going to leave Tom Brady for now and see how far he can take this thing. No mercy. The Cowboys are preparing for the playoff opener against the 49ers. And Jerry Jones wants home field advantage to help push his team to victory. Jerry told a radio show that AT&T Stadium will be, quote, roaring and said that he'd like to increase the standing room only capacity so that more than 100,000 fans can show up on Sunday. Uh, Shannon, Dallas has the NFL's biggest home attendance by a wide margin. So scale of one to 10, how big is the Cowboys home field advantage here? A zero. There's no home field advantage. Zero. You know what? Because, Skip, if you think about it, Skip, what they've done with the modern stadium, Skip, is that they made it a sole venue about entertainment. It's no more about, you used to be, Skip, the crowd was into the game. Now, it used to be, you go to a game, Skip, you got hot dogs, you got hamburgers, you got some nachos, popcorn. Skip, they got five-star Michelin chefs preparing food at the, at the stadiums now. And that, people go to Jerry World, Skip, to see the Jumbotron and to see all the entertainment, the women that they got dancing up in, in the corner of the end zone. So now, instead of going to actual game, Skip, you're going to be entertained about the entertainment that's not on the field. It's different, Skip. When I played, you go to Arrowhead, there was none of that, all that fancy stuff. It was just 80,000 no. fans dressed in red screaming. You came to Mile High, there was 77,000 dressed in orange or blue, and they were screaming their heads off. Or you go to Pittsburgh. Now, Skip, these stadiums have been so updated, so modernized. They... You got Wi-Fi. They're trying to keep you entertained while you're there. They don't care if you don't watch the game, Skip. We got you there. We got in your pocket. If you go with kids, you're going to buy you're gonna buy a jersey. You're going to buy a flyer. You're going to buy something. Skip, it's different now. But the Cowboys have really never had a home field advantage, Skip. Nobody's like, man, man, it's really hard to play at AT&T. Skip, it wasn't hard to play in Texas Stadium. They've never had a home field advantage, say, like yeah. Kansas City. Oh, no, no, the home field advantage that they had was good teams. 
Denver, we have a home field advantage. Arrowhead, Skip, you see that building? What's imposing about that? They got girls, they got people pouring shots. They got girls dancing up in the corner. Where, what, 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 what's imposing? And, soon, and guess what? Soon as you get down, I'm a, and I'm predicting this right on cue, you get down 7 nothing. you can hear a rat peeing on cotton up in that thing on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Want to bet? Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, I'll bet. We're not going to get down 7 to nothing. By the way, how many cases do we have bet now? Eight? Hold on. Let me see. Let me see. Would let me you see. like to make it nine? You know what? Nine you going keep, once. You, you <laughs> keep on poking the bear. You keep on poking the bear. The, poking. Bo- the bear was walking away. I had to do my damage to you. I walking away, and you pulled me by the tail. So now I got to turn around. And- Nine it is. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Scale of one to ten. Home field advantage. If we were talking about a regular season game at Jerry World, I would give it close to you. I'd give it a two. This is a playoff game at AT&T, and playoff games there have been very different than regular season games. I give you that this is an entertainment destination. This is almost like become America's stage because it's more of a concert venue than it is a football venue because we got Jay-Z and Beyonce playing there, and then the Rolling Stones and Paul McCartney and George Strait and... Taylor Swift, and we can go on and on. Everybody plays the palace that is Jerry World. I got right. it. In Final Fours and WrestleMania and big college football games, we get it. We yes, get it. national championship games in college. Yes, yes. Okay, now before I launch on this, let me go back to Texas Stadium. That had mystique. That had 10 out of 10 home field to me, and I don't know how you could blast it because it had – the actual first hole in the roof. Yes, and Skip. people would say it's so God can look down and watch his team win football games. Yeah, because it was Skip. God's team, thanks but to Skip. Coach Landry, the man in Skip. the hat. That's the that's my point. It was the uniqueness, the design of the building, not so much the crowd. Skip, Lambeau Field has a home field advantage because of the elements. Mm-hmm. Okay, you don't have a home field because you got no elements because your building is closed. You keep the cl- you keep it closed. Okay, but 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 who was the first team to have cheerleaders dressed as showgirls? You, you, the you Dallas did. Cowboys, right? That's entertainment. Thank you very much. So you got okay, the fans looking it, at the cheerleaders and not your mystique. team. It was a hard place to win because it was kind of weird. It was just like, wow, we're going to get overwhelmed by the magnitude of all this. <laughs> no, Not no. so much at Jerry World. I got it. So it's been 13 years, a lucky 13 years. We're finishing year 13. The regular season record there is all of 58 and 46. And remember, Eli actually won the first ever game there back in 2009 and went in the locker room and wrote on the wall something about uh, first win at the new stadium. Thank you, Eli. So you got yeah. it. So that's, <laughs> that started off the wrong direction. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Hmm. Four playoff games has been played at Jerry World, and my team has won three of them because all of a sudden the playoff game is different because the Cowboy fans now view it as a concert-like event. It's like Jay-Z and Beyonce are going to play Sunday against the 49ers. It's like... You, you go for the magnitude of the event. It's a playoff game. And Jerry wants right. to sell out the standing room, which I'm sure will increase the number of 49er fans in their garnet and gold. I'm sure you're going to see a lot of that. And, it's and going to increase the, way, the number Sean, of something else, too. There, there's, something else that's go, there's something else going around in the air that's been rampant over the last month oh, and okay. a half, two months. Right. So okay. he's going cre- to increase that also. That's a whole other issue. Okay. But y'all lose okay, it. But I don't the, care what he puts in okay, there. Okay, but the, the point is, even though the 49er fans felt like they're about 50-50 at so fine stadium right. last Sunday against uh, right. obviously against the Rams, the Rams. That, that it caught the Rams off guard and they said we had trouble calling our own offensive signals at home because the 49er fans were so loud. There may be some of that operating on A Sunday at that. Jerry World. But I'm telling you, Those Cowboy fans live for all that matters, playoffs. And once you get a playoff game there, when he said, Jerry said, they'll be roaring, they will be roaring on Sunday. It will have much more extreme home field advantage this time than it does for any regular season game. Cowboy fans are spoiled rotten, even though we have not won a Super Bowl since the 1995 season. 
They believe that playoffs are all that matter. This matters. This will be a roaring throng of Cowboy fans who will go to it like it's an event because this team they know is special. This team has been different. This team has 11 from heaven. Micah Parsons, people are going to go with an expectation that the best thing, not the worst thing, is going to happen. But think about what you just said the other day. Mike McCarthy says he's hoping for a home field advantage. And you said, what does he mean by that? That means that the Cowboy faithful don't sell their tickets to the 49ers. What home field advantage does that? You don't worry about that at Pittsburgh. You don't worry about that at Lambeau. You don't worry about that at Arrowhead. You don't worry about that at Mile High. Why are you worried about somebody, the visiting team, buying up your tickets? If the home field is what you said it is, you told me that's because the visitors buy up the tickets because the Cowboys fans sell sell their tickets because they already know Mm -hmm. what's going to happen. They already know you're going to catch that L, and they don't want to be disappointed. They want to cry in the privacy of their own home. They don't want you to see them crying on television or while some fan that they don't, some person they don't know walking out, you walking out the building, you cry. The Cowboys, they did it to me again. I ain't listening to Skip Bayless no more because he told me this year was going to be different, and it's going to be the same year as it has for the last 26. We should be 4-0 and oh in playoffs, except for those hand-of-God <laughs> field goals by Mason Crossbar. Oh, and we no. will be 4-1 no, and one in the playoffs no, you, no, after we beat the 49ers. I guarantee it. I book it. I lock it. They go and, I look, they go and look at the Jumbotron. Man, that's a big old... Ooh, <laughs> that is really impressive. It's an incredible Jumbotron, I have to say. It's, it's pretty amazing in there. No mercy. The Steelers are big underdogs against the Chiefs on Sunday. And earlier this week, Big Ben leaned into that mentality, telling reporters, quote, we don't have a chance, so let's just go in and play and have fun. If Kansas City wins, as expected, it'll likely be Roethlisberger's final game in the NFL. And he seems to be embracing the nothing left to lose mindset. I respect that. Shannon, what shot do you give the Steelers of pulling off the upset here? I don't give them much of a chance. Um, Skip, I get what Ben is trying to do. He's trying to heap all the pressure on the Kansas City Chiefs. He's like, guys, we, we, we got no chance. Man, they got Patrick Mahomes. They got Travis Kelsey. They got Tyreek Hill. Man, they got this dynamic offense that can dial it up and can score 50 points at the blink of an hat. And we got this little lonely us. We got no chance, so let's just go have fun. So I get what he's trying to do, Skip. I just do not believe Ben can push the ball down the field enough to beat them. Over their last seven games, the Pittsburgh Steelers is averaging 18 points a game. His last four games, 25 pass attempts for 148 yards, 35 pass attempts, 159 yards, 46 passes for 123 yards, 44 passes for 244. Now, remember, Skip, the last time they played, Travis Kelsey was in protocol. He didn't play. Tyreek only had play, only played two plays. No, he had two catches, only played 29 snaps. He had got cleared the day before. I believe they win this game. I'm not going to say I don't believe I don't know if they blow him out 36-10 because I don't expect Ben to turn the ball over on the first possession and play as poorly as he did. I think he plays a little better, but I'm not going to be I'm not I don't give them much of a chance if any chance. I mean, or I shouldn't say any because mm. anything can happen in sports, but I'm going to take the Kansas City. I'm going to say they win by. I'm going to say they cover. I say they cover. Do you? Yeah. So I hear everything you just said, and I love what Ben said because he said, we're the 14th of 14 teams. We're not a very good football team because they're really not. Right. They got issues all over the place. The offensive line's a wreck. The defense has been underachieving all year long, even though they can rush the passer, they can't cover anybody. I thought they could run it, and they can't run it with Najee in part because the offensive line can't block anybody. Ben is aging and nearer the end, and yet I don't know how they did it when you least expected it. They somehow (laughs) beat the Browns, and they somehow beat the Ravens, and voila, they're in. And here's why I believe they will cover. Here's why I believe it'll be closer than, what is it, 12 and a half? Closer than 12 and a half. Because they still have Mike Tomlin, and Ben Roethlisberger. And Ben is 13-9 and nine in the postseason with two Super Bowl rings. And his last playoff win is still a ways back. It was 2016. It was at this stadium. At Kansas City. What did they win? It was, it was one of those 16, low scoring. I think, I think 2016. 18-16. 18 okay, is a two-point okay. game. 
Right. It was the A-B game when he went Facebook Live in the locker room right. after the game. Correct. Okay. So that guy, Ben Roethlisberger, number seven, is an old war horse. And I just believe whatever he's got left, you're going to get it. And mm-hmm. as Tomlin said the other day, he, he, when it gets funny out there, when everybody else starts to gag a little bit, he doesn't. He just stays Ben. He just plays Ben. And I believe they will play a, a Kansas City team that has not been quite right the whole year. I think they will play them closer than you think. So if you'd like yeah. to bet one case, I will take the 12 and a half. Would you do that? Well, Skip, you remember now uh, that last the last time they won there, Le'Veon Bell went. I think he went over 200 yards running the football. He did. Are you going to tell me Najee Harris is going to have 200 yards? So that way you can control the clock. You keep Patrick Mahomes in a high flying offense off the field. Now, if you do that, yeah, the game they'll be, not only will the game be close. Pittsburgh has a great opportunity to win the game. I'm, a, you know what? They're going to win by 10 to 13. So I can see Pittsburgh possibly kicking a field goal, trying to get an onside kick. I'm going to say they win by 10. I'm going to say uh, the Kansas City comes, wins by 10. They don't cover. You talk Chicken me out, out again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No mercy. Carson Wentz season came to a heartbreaking end after the Colts couldn't beat the Jaguars. And now Indianapolis GM Chris Ballard isn't ready to commit to Wentz as the signal caller moving forward, saying, I won't make a comment on who's going to be here and who's not going to be here. That's not fair. So, Shannon, are you ready to give up once and for all on walking to him, Wentz? Hell, I left a long time ago, Skip. <laughs> it oh. doesn't look good for Wentz when the, uh, when the general manager says what he says. I can see him getting cut, saving $13 million, Skip. You can't lose a game like this when a team has nothing to play for except ruining your season. I've been trying to tell you for years. 